Hi. Uh, thanks, Eva, for joining us. Um, you gave a wonderful, distinguished lecture last month, uh, exploring the fertile area of games between learning agents. Um, and you're back again this month uh, for a deeper dive with algorithms and machine learning groups here. I'm very curious to hear how your trip has been going and what's bringing you back. Um, Microsoft Research is a great place with lots of great people. Somehow the way the distinguished lecture was set up, it didn't turn out to be the best time to extend it for a longer visit. I'm now back mostly to work with Nikhil, but I've been talking to other Microsoft researchers. This is a great group. There are a lot of great people here. Could you go into some high-level details about the talk? You spoke, uh, the distinguished lecture, where you spoke about a new no-regret model to study behavior in massive online games, like for ad auctions and traffic routing and things like that. Could you uh, describe some of that work? So one interesting aspect in, if you think about game theory from a CS perspective, that a lot of the games that we care about, like I guess Microsoft truly must care about ad auctions, but um, I guess another prime example is uh, packet routing on the internet. Those are really repeated games that mm -hmm. are not happening once but instead happening over and over every millisecond, mm -hmm. millions of them a, you know, a day. And mm -hmm. uh, what's really important about them is not any single act, but instead the overall um, performance. Like for any single packet on the packet routing, if the system can deliver a packet on time, they just drop it and send it again, which works just well. The ad auctions, every single ad is a couple of you know, a fraction of a cent usually, and what's really valuable is the volume of ads here. In this kind of setups, the classical notions of game theory maybe are less applicable, and it's very natural to try to use, for, for the participants to try to use an explore, exploit style learning algorithm to figure out what might be a good strategy. Hmm. Um, they often don't exactly know who the opponents are if you're a, you know, packet router, you don't actually know what are the other streams of packets, but you can try sending it someplace and and sending packets in some direction and see what happens, and uh, that's a good way to figure out what's best. And Similar things apply in, it's the exploration is trying, and then, you know, seeing how fast it gets delivered, and then, okay, that was a good rat, that was a bad rat. Mm -hmm. uh, Similar thing happens in ad auction, where uh, there are other parameters I guess if you're a you know, pizza company, you do know who are the other pizza deliverers in town, but you don't know what the advertising, things change, and so again, trying to explore what are the good ads, what are the successful ads, is a good way to learn. Mm -hmm. Now, if I want to employ classical learning theory here, one important facet here is that the prior, the environment in which I'm working, is not a patient prior because the other participants are also exploring the learning. It's not a fixed prior. In fact, the environment reacts to me. Mm -hmm. If I start advertising very aggressively with high bits in something, the, the opponent might back off and go away or might compete higher or I don't know what he'll do. But it's not a steady Bayesian prior environment, but instead something else. Maybe not the worst case, but something um, interesting. Certainly yeah. where the environment reacts to me. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, this no regret learning, which is what we're using in our work, is great because that works against the worst case adversary. In particular, it works whatever this environment is. Mm. But one question I raised in the talk is that uh, a, an opponent who wants to himself, you know, win the ads or rat his own packet is not actually worst case. So mm -hmm. maybe the no worst case notion of the no regret theory went a little too far. And mm -hmm. the interesting example to think about that even if we're playing a two person zero sum game, so every time I win, you lose. Like rock, so paper, scissors? Rock, paper, scissors, matching pennies, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, your goal 
in playing this game is distinctly, I guess, to win, which otherwise means you want me to lose. Mm -hmm. That's not the same goal as you want me to have high regret. You just want to win. You're not, not, worst, you're not worst case from the regret perspective. Mm. You worst case in, in the sense of wanting me to lose, that's not the same thing. Mm. So it would be interesting to find a, a sort of mole that understands these issues better. Mm. But certainly anything that works with no regret uh, offers certain guarantees because that's against the worst case worst opponent. Case adversity. An interesting concept that came up uh, during the talk was this idea of a coarse correlated equilibrium, which seemed to be, a, uh, at a high level, it seemed to be that if we could get humans aware of their behavior, we could get them all to correlate their actions in a way to achieve a better equilibrium than what we popularly know as the Nash equilibrium, where everyone is selfishly looking out for themselves. And I'm very curious to hear your perspectives on why you feel that's a good equilibrium to study, why the intersection of game theory and computer science naturally gives us algorithms that allow us to reach such equilibria, and how we might implement this in practice. So early work in, in learning in game theory, which actually started from the econ community, not from the computer scientist, I guess maybe predating our existence as a field, or certainly predating our interest in game theory, um, was aimed at hoping that these learning players will reach a Nash equilibrium. Uh, today we know that that's not going to work out because we have uh, computational uh, complexity results showing that finding Nash equilibrium is hard. So in particular, a simple learning algorithm can't find it because no algorithm can, or at least unless some complexity classes collapse. Um, what happens when players engage in, in, in no regret style learning behavior is that they naturally get correlated. And the way they get correlated is that if we're playing a game together, we're both trying to learn our behavior from past data, then that past data correlates us. We're learning from we the same thing. History. We have a shared history, and that shared history causes us to do something that correlates us. So in some games, uh, this correlation goes away in the limit, and at the end, we converge to Nash equilibrium. But in other games, we do not. And our behavior, even in the limit, will uh, converge to something that's a, what's called correlated equilibrium. It's an analog to Nash equilibrium, except for allowing our, our behavior to get correlated. So. One advantage of this, this is that it's computationally feasible, like in particular very simple learning algorithms can converge to it, uh, unlike Nash equilibrium that has computational difficulties. It also is a natural model of behavior to try to update based on data, or at least I, I believe it is, and, when, and data sets often show that people do achieve uh, the no regret property that the learning requires. Um, it's not clear it's a better model, it's a reachable model. And it's a, a model that contains all of the Nash equilibria. So Nash equilibria are particular points in the big set of behaviors. Mm -hmm. And course correlated equilibria are a convex set surrounding these points. It's a bigger set. Mm -hmm. It's convex, which has a advantages in finding it. Um, is it better? It's findable. Uh, and if we can say something about all, all of these correlated or course correlated equilibria, that does some says something powerful about all kinds of behavior, including Nash equilibria. Yep. There is a subtle issue here. If I actually make you aware that we're playing a particular course correlated equilibria, then you might not want to pay, play your part. It's not always or often, it's not best response for you, mm -hmm. given that you know what I do, to actually do it. You can somehow sink ahead a step ahead uh -huh. and be a bit smarter. Uh -huh. And maybe I can try to be a bit smarter too. And it's not clear what this sinking ahead behavior will do under reasonable models, we st still stay in the big convex set of, of course-correlated equilibria, 
Um, what's more questionable whether I can predict the behavior. Can I predict which part of this set our behavior will be at? I'm not sure. Hmm. Fascinating. You, you mentioned the econ folks got uh, interested in learning and game theory together uh, before computer scientists looked at it. But I have a personal opinion, which is that you are one of the first people I look up to who started thinking computationally. Like the, the, my textbook that opened the world of game theory to me was Algorithmic Game Theory with Tim Ravgarden, you and Wazirani. Um, and I found it a very refreshing and take Noam on- And Nis Noam Nissan. And Noam Nissan. The first, yeah. we should not forget Noam Nissan as an actor. And, um, I think I didn't get the first edition though. I got a later edition, no, or, or no. one of the editions. No, oh. it's not on this end, it's always okay, there. Always there. Sorry. Uh, my bad. Um, right, so could you in give a retrospective on how game theory evolved and how the computational subfield that is algorithmic game theory evolved? So I certainly want to start with giving Christos Papa Dimitriou the true credit for making this revolution happen. I heard Christos talk about game theory when I first showed up in the US as a postdoc researcher, I think, certainly late 80s, maybe even earlier. Um, at the time, uh, so he was interested in game theory much, much before the rest of us or many of us got interested. Uh, when he started to take up game theory again and uh, and when this change in the way computer scientists think about it, game theory uh, happened is around the turn of like around the 2000 or maybe 1999 or eight, I'm not really sure when the first talks happened, where he started to uh, champion the thought that for you know, however long uh, computer science existed as a field, our main mission was to design algorithms, design machines, think about how machines would work. And that with the advent of the internet, this really changed. We each designing individual machines, but where the most important thing is how do these machines collaborate with each other, and that we should think of the internet via a game theoretic thinking where multiple parties, the, your individual laptop and my individual laptop, or one router against another router, um, collaborate and compete with each other in a somewhat, somewhat shared, somewhat not so shared goal. Mm -hmm. The way my laptop is optimized, it's not actually trying to have um, good experience for the rest of the world, it's trying to make it a good experience for me to reach the internet, and that's the same for your laptop, and that's exactly what game theory tries to mold, where everyone's selfishly optimizing for themselves, that is what these machines are doing. Um, that's a profound change in thinking. He gave a whole bunch of talks um, at different conferences, and really profoundly got all the, certainly the theoretical computer science community, but I think the broader CS community interested in this way of thinking. Um, the book you mentioned, uh, he wrote the preface for it. It's a beautiful preface, which I recommend all of you, everyone read. Um, and in what we did with Noam, Vijay, and Tim is wrote some chapters and asked some other people to write chapters, Christos included, uh, so that we can really, really fast react to this change of thinking. If one person writes a book, that will take a while. You have to write all the chapters. If we ask everyone to write just one chapter each, then we can put something on the shelves of everyone very, very fast, and that's what we did. But you got so, all of you to correlate and collaborate. We collaborated. <laughs> um, but my interest in, the, in this topic really stems from Christos is convincing argument. I actually spent a sabbatical in Berkeley in 1999-2000, and uh, that's when I started to work on this, Men, large part prompted by Christos. So uh, while I like the idea of bringing, this, the, bringing uh, computational thinking to econ, or actually be, bringing game theory to CS, um, I, I should 
give credit where credit is due, Christos was the one that really started this revolution. And uh, like looking ahead, where we are in an online social interaction world now, in an increasingly digital life, uh, it feels like all these arguments that you just described are even more uh, vital. So do you see game theory playing a vital role going forward? Like what's the outlook you have? Definitely, you're yeah. totally right um, in, in many different ways. One problem in applying game theory to human behavior is that it's a totally non-trivial task to model what our incentives are. In very simplistic game theoretic models, you have a, a nice and clean objective function. You're saying that the traffic writer's goal is to deliver the packets as fast as possible, that humans' interest is to make as much money as possible, um, and so on. When you have a very clean objective function, then game theory offers a beautiful and elegant model on what will happen in, in, in behavior. Um, it's less clear if you don't actually know how to model uh, behavior. So some of the examples you described were the humans involved rather than routers or, yeah. or, or, or automats. Um, we have to have a better model of what do humans really want. And one interesting thing that's happening exactly part of the same digital revolution is that we have a lot of data traces of what people do. So you know, hopefully, and this is happening, we can infer better of actually what is a good model of human behavior, what do people actually want, what objective function describes them, mm -hmm. how to model their behavior. Um, no regret learning is an attempt at such a behavior. Um, it ignores a lot of different aspects. So mm -hmm. certainly there are some data sets that we're looking at where no regret learning is not a good behavior model, uh, maybe in large part because the participants don't pay enough attention. Um, no regret learning, assume that you actually are paying attention to what's happening and updating your behavior sufficiently often. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one issue. Sometimes there are other, uh, you know, attention span or interest or how much you care, how often you update your bits is an important parameter that's not in these models. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other ways that the be that it is not a perfect behavioral model of what's happening even in places like ad auctions, thinking of advertisers that update very, very frequently. So those are advertisers that clearly pay attention and they seem to have an algorithmic tool behind them to allow them updates you know, many times a day. Mm -hmm. um, better understanding of what drives these models and what's important uh, will lead to better and better use of game theory. But I think game theory will remain an important tool. And, and there was one interesting thing that came out during your talk where uh, you commented that um, in these ad auctions, uh, for example, on Bing ads or something, often there are these predictive black boxes that will give the users their entire payoff curves, which allows users to reason about not just what's the result of the action they took, but also what if they had placed a different bid and so on. And um, I, I realize that having access to such predictive boxes basically allows game theory to make some kinds of assumptions, but it can also lead to some frustrating thing where we don't know what's inside these black boxes. And that seems to tie neatly with um, all our efforts in trying to make these black boxes more transparent, more interpretable, and just in general there is this push within AI to make these predictive black boxes fair, accountable, transparent, and I'm curious where you see the, the potential synergies as we start building these models of users. How, how do you anticipate the interaction with game theory in the years to come? Um, interesting uh, questions you're asking and a lot of different connections here. So um, maybe there are two parts that I want to separate a little bit. Mm -hmm. So what was relevant in, in the ad auction model is what do players know? So if you're a ratter 
and you chose a particular path to send your packet on, then clearly you're getting no feedback of what would have happened to your packet had you sent on another pass. You're going to have to send the packet that way too. So the feedback there is about the pass you selected and it's not about other pass. Mm -hmm. uh, in contrast, in ad auction, um, big companies being included uh, do give better feedback. They tell the, tell the customers if they ran a, a bid for a particular period of time that what would they giving you a so-called curve of giving you what other bids would have given you if you had you paid a different bid then your uh, payment would have been higher and your um, your but you your ad would have seen by more people um, these response curves are very useful for learning clearly more information it's easier to learn um, and being as does Google or any other company does have enough information to give this to make these predictive curves correct. There's no prediction here. They simply know what happened mm -hmm. and they can give you uh, actual results of what would have happened had you bid higher. They know what everyone else bid. They simply know uh, what the bids were and they can aggregate these numbers and tell you what the answer is. Now, one, part, one issue that got raised during the talk is um, do advertisers trust that these curves are correct? And I have no information whether people trust it on the Bing website, but I do understand that there are certainly trust issues at other places. Uh, especially their trust issues, if you not only want to uh, give them past data, which is a fact you should know, like mm -hmm. Bing should know, but instead want to give a suggestion of what might be a good bid, a mm -hmm. so-called recommendation, a recommended action. That there are certainly trust issues, and many bidders, both at Bing and many other places, prefer to use third-party optimizers, in part due to lack of trust, I believe. Mm. That who knows if Bing may be really optimizing for me, or are you optimizing for, the, for Bing itself, for the company? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so there is the version whether do I trust that the data you provided is correct, and that might be an issue also. A bigger issue is, do I trust your recommendation? Mm -hmm. And then there is the third issue that your recommendation might be based on machine learning, which we don't fully understand, and it would be nice to have a better understandable model. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe that would help the trust issue, but part of the trust issue is, is, is an incentive compatibility issue. If I, you know, if we're playing chess and I suggest that, you know, you really should make that move, but you're playing against me, you might think that, hmm, is she suggesting a move that's good for me or that's good for her? Mm -hmm. So in this extent, there is a trust issue that's not about the, the lack of understanding of, of what causes machine learning to make a suggestion, but instead, just literally, in some way, we're, we're, our, our incentives are aligned, but in other ways, they're not. So there is possibly an incentive problem. Does the, I'm, I'm sure for anyone who's looking up your work and others work in algorithmic game theory, they will see the phrase mechanism design come up often. Is that, uh, could you explain at a high level what that is and could some ideas from there help with this incentive alignment uh, problem and engender trust? Sure, mechanism design is, is uh, at the high level, it's designing algorithms that will be good for selfish users. Um, you know, the, the prototypical classical example is second price auction. So if we auctioning up a, a, a single item and we could auction it the way you contract for selling a house, uh, namely, you make an offer and then the highest offer will get taken and is going to have to pay whatever he offered, in which case there's a lot of strategizing going into what might be the right bid. You want to get the house, but you would like to get it cheap. Right. Uh, and then there is second price where, um, again, the highest bidder wins, but the price he pays is the second highest bid. Uh, that is the minimum bid he had to make in order to win, not his actual bid but the smallest number he could have had. Mm -hmm. 
which effectively does the strategizing for you, and it's easily think, easy to think through that in this second price, it's best to just tell the true maximum you're willing to pay, uh, because that's not going to be the price. Um, mechanism design is uh, tr often aims at trying to design mechanisms where the simple, truthful behavior is everyone's best behavior in the system, no matter what everyone else does, which certainly makes life easier. Um, one issue is um, using mechanism design in the kind of situations I talked about in the lecture, that is games that are repeated, um, that you have to be careful it stays, 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 sorry, stays, uh, a good man is a good strategy for people to tell the truth, even in the repeated setting. For example, in a second price auction, um, it does not. I tell you in iteration one what my true value for this ad is, but about 10 seconds later, the reserve price will go up just a cent below my true value, and look what, suddenly I'm gonna have to tell my value, pay my value, that's not gonna be so good. Right. So. There's a beautiful theory of single-shot mechanisms that are, um, their truth-telling is a dominant strategy that is the good behavior for people. And we are only now start to develop um, the area called dynamic mechanism design that wants to develop good mechanisms that stay good even in the repeated setting or are designed for being good in a repeated setting. Fascinating. Uh, Popping up from the technical level, I wanted to, um, ask uh, meta-level questions about the research process, right? Um, for people who are interested in game theory and who are getting started reading up on the literature, the, the vast fascinating literature and exciting new results in dynamic mechanism design, um, it can be quite intimidating to see acronyms thrown around like STOCK, FOX, EC, SODA. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, could you like elaborate a bit on the, bit on the community, a bit on the the research process, what it takes to make an impactful contribution. So I guess these acronyms you're throwing around are conference names, and in fact, interestingly, uh, these are theory conference names. So um, despite this being an AI uh, distinguished lecture series, I actually more identify it as a member of the theory community, though uh, in the economics and computing space, there is a lot of interaction between AI and and theory. So Fox Talk is the two premier theory conferences and a lot of theoretical work or some amount of theoretical work in this um, game theory uh, economics interface does get published in Fox Talk. Uh, EC, which stands for uh, ACM Conference of Economics and Computation, uh, is a dedicated conference to this topic. Uh, and in fact, it's a conference that uh, has a multiple different tracks, has a theory track, has an AI track, and has an empirical track, mm -hmm. uh, applied track, I forgot, empirical track. Um, and indeed, uh, the conference, regular conference attended, there's a lot of theoreticians, but a lot of people from the AI community, and um, even love some people from the econ community regularly show up and submit they, they work at EC. So EC has been a really great Ferta grand of uh, mixing mm -hmm. and, you know, at the interface of AI and theory, uh, even some amount of machine learning, though actually more classical AI and, and the AI people uh, like Ario Procaccia or David Parks or, uh, or, or uh, you know, Sentholm or a whole bunch of them that are really interested. You have Shoam, I can, you know, there's a long list of AI, uh, of, of lead AI researchers who are very interested in the game theory interface. Often these people don't literally ask the same questions, but they're very related questions and very, hmm. um, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a really great community where people interact with each other. Um, you asked how one makes an impact. Um, I mean, the way computer science and many of the science fields work is the 
apprenticeship system of getting PhD students to work with an advisor, and I definitely uh, think that the way, as you point out, the, the literature is vast, and just someone completely on their own getting started in reading literature seemed like a very hard task, and I certainly uh, wouldn't recommend this to people. And in, in fact, having some guidance with someone senior in the field, um, I think is the right way to get started. And I guess one uh, way this person can help you, or maybe you can uh, realize this, that some of the changes in, in life and some of the changes in perspective because of our computer science perspective um, changes the kind of questions we ask. Mm -hmm. um, and working on those questions is both incredibly impact impactful because these are new questions and also um, maybe a little bit easier to make an impact because often you want to, you realize that yes, there is an amazing literature out there with a lot of beautiful work, but this is a new question. Like, for example, I was originally thinking of Price of Energy as a question like this. There's a lot of beautiful work in the classical game theory literature on when is it that Nash equilibrium is guaranteed to have socially optimal outcome and when is it when it doesn't have socially op optimal outcome. Mm -hmm. But it, they much less ask the question that when it's not actually literally optimal, how off is it? And mm -hmm. it does make a big difference if the welfare at equilibrium is, is vanishing and we are in a tragedy of the commons kind of situation versus, yeah, we lost a little bit, it's not so bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and making that distinction is important and it's a question that has not been extensively studied historically in, in economics. Um, so asking these new questions based on our new perspectives can lead to impactful research? I think directions. so. And I think the combination of learning and games Mm -hmm. uh, is also a bit like this. Even though there have been history of thinking of learning and games as a combination, um, again, I think the econ focus was what is the kind of learning behavior that helps the players find the Nash equilibrium as a kind of pre-play or cheap talk before the game on which we coordinate on a Nash equilibrium. And I guess our perspective with the big data is thinking of learning as a, as a behavior model. This is what people do, mm -hmm. not to find an equilibrium, this is just real life, yeah. and I want to know what happens. Right. And for students who have got started on research or are early stage career researchers, I'm very curious if you have any advice on your organizational principles for research or how do you balance demands on your time? <laughs> Demands on my time. I wish I balanced it better. Um, you know, there are lots of things you want to do, and I guess you have to be figure out what works for you for protecting some of your time. Mm -hmm. I really like teaching. I like interacting with people who not, don't yet know the field and showing them the beauty in algorithms in game theory. Um, but at the same time, I also want to have enough impact in research. Uh, as you get older, you get asked to a fair amount of service and as an impact to the community, and I guess you care about that too. And of course, all of us have some personal life, so this is not even for 24 hours, but you know, less than that, because you might want to do other things in your life. Um, it's a hard task, and you have to find your own balance of what might be right and what's important. I don't know if I have any, a really good advice on. Any good habits for being productive and asking impactful questions in research? Any daily habits that you have that you think? I mean, one thing that, especially since I'm doing this at Microsoft and maybe some of the audience are uh, Microsoft or other industry researchers, um, is I find the pressure coming from the National Science Foundation to write grant proposals very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes one think every you know, couple of years uh, how to pitch one's research, not an existing result that you already proved and you want to explain to a conference, but in a way it gets you involved into effectively writing the introduction to your paper before you prove the paper. That is before you know 
what results you have, you need to try to explain to someone that you will care about the results. This is very important. You, you need to be able to convince yourself that what you're doing <laughs> will have an impact and it's important. And it's a good idea to try to write this down and try to convince the community of this. Um, and engage in this thinking, possibly before you spend you know, months and months figuring out the answer. Um, I don't know what replaces this if you're an industry researcher, but as an academic, NSF is making me, or NSF and other funding agencies, making me write grant proposals. And as annoying as it can be when the deadline pressure happens, at the high level, it's really great that people engage in this high level thinking of what. I also like the idea of somewhat going with the flow and what are new and interesting questions and uh, you know, keeping your eyes open of what are the research areas which are new and exciting and where the kind of knowledge and tools that you bring to research could be impactful hmm. is something I would like to, I, I did in my past, I hope I did in my past and I suggest everyone else should uh, be open to, to somewhat changing areas. Hmm. As we conclude the chat, I'm also curious to hear your outlook, not on the technical side of how game theory, what are the interesting questions out there, but how we might see it implemented in society or in applications, like what's the role of government, what's the role of private actors, and how, how might this play out? Well, that's a very hard question. I'm not so sure I, uh, I know how to react to this. So, I mean, in some way, um, what government and the rules of government do is a form of mechanism design. You can interfere with what's allowed and what's not allowed and what are the ways we're interacting with each other as a society. Um, in places like ad auction, companies are doing mechanism design also. They're designing mm -hmm. their mechanism, but there is a higher level version where you know, Microsoft competes with Google or Facebook or whatever, all the competitors. And that mechanism design is governed by uh, the rules yeah, of the country yes. or uh, legal laws and stuff like that. So that's a mechanism design question also. Uh, so there are a lot of like high level uh, questions of this form. Um, game theory, of, there is the sort of game theory of the kind I more talked about in the lecture whose goal is more trying to understand what likely outcome happens in a game. That understanding is definitely helpful in designing rules. You want to know what will happen before you uh, implement a, mm -hmm. a rule change. Um, mechanism design is directly aiming at designing mechanisms with the goal of you know, making social welfare high or making inequality less bad or you know, many other great goals that hopefully are companies and governments aim to implement. Mm -hmm. um, and I sincerely hope that a lot of the research that's happening here will both help companies design better mechanisms in their own uh, space and also advise the governments in some way. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the ultimate goal. I wanted to spend at least a sentence championing your selfless community service and like writing books and like selfless education, uh, your involvement with the ACM and outreach efforts. I wanted to give you a chance to like celebrate and amplify the work that <laughs> you're doing in all these other areas that make the community a worthwhile <laughs> place to be a part of. Thank you very much. I, I you know, writing books, um, I guess there are two books associated with me, the Algorithms Textbook with John Kleinberg and the, uh, this Algorithmic Game Theory edited volume. Uh, for both of them, I got involved and I did it because I had a view of uh, what I want to tell the community and the book is an excellent way to have an impact. Um, Algorithms is a course that is taught at virtually every school and it's required in many, many schools. And um, we have, we had a way of um, 
wanting to teach the course differently than many of the textbook. I guess one uh, important aspect is to emphasize throughout the course how important these applications are, rather than starting every, any lecture with, you know, X1 and Xn are n numbers and you want to do this, every chapter or every lecture starts with some application that explains what on earth those Xs might be. Um, and we are assigning homework this way too. Instead of the homework starting with given n numbers, find the median, it's some sort of English story, company wants this and that. If you understood the story, at the heart of it, you actually uh, want the median. Uh, but the first job for an undergraduate is to understand what the English said. What did this company really want? Um, I think this is very important, maybe one of the most important things we're teaching as part of algorithms. And we wanted to change the course and to change the way algorithms is taught in many, many schools to emphasize this, I guess, often called the modeling aspect. Mm -hmm. um, and so we wrote a textbook that does this. Um, I also really liked, uh, and again, that's another thing we do both in lectures and in the book, is not start with the correct algorithm, but start with the first natural ID and have in lecture or in the textbook explain of how um, you know, this would be a natural thing to do, but it doesn't quite work out, so you have to do this little bit more sophisticated thing. That is, to lead people how someone thought of this algorithm, rather than just, here's a beautiful algorithm, done. Um, and again, that was a way I liked thinking, and I wanted to think, and I, you know, wanted to teach this way at Cornell, and I love the idea that many other places that adopted either the book or even when they didn't adopt the book, they adopted this way of thinking. Our algorithmic game theory is a bit similar. It was a new field. We wanted to get many people involved, so we wanted to get the knowledge out there. And um, I don't know how, I, you know, I think having impact through this getting knowledge of getting a way of thinking out there is part of what happens in teaching too. I did say I like teaching, I like bringing uh, people who don't yet know anything and bringing them algorithms or bringing them game theory or any field I know. Uh, and the book did a little bit the same thing, so it's, it serves the same way of having impact. I know you remain an inspiration for me. Like my introduction to computer science was through algorithm design, Kleinberg Tadosh. My first brush with serious computer science research was a machine learning project which crucially needed a very fast network flow algorithm as a subroutine, your network flow algorithm. Uh, my first textbook in graduate school was Algorithm Game Theory. Uh, and I think throughout grad school, I was so fortunate to have you as my minor thank advisor you, thank too. You. <laughs> so thank you very much. You, you have been an inspiration throughout and you remain, <laughs> you will remain. <laughs> and I'm sincerely thankful. I but I also want to thank. I should add that you were a great student to have because <laughs> you're a, a, a you know a more empirical machine learning student, not on your own publishing in naturally in the Fox Talk community, and yet you seem very interested and um, in in theoretical ideas and more willing to um, think what the impact they have in in AI. And I think people. Uh, in order for these two fields to, to successfully interact with each other, we need both sides. We need people with theoretical um, you know, interest and who identify as theoreticians to be interested in having an impact, but we need people from the uh, more empirical community to actually be interested in reaching out and using these ideas. And it's great to have people like you. Thanks so much, Eva, again. And Thank thanks you. from all of MSR for visiting us again. And we are looking forward to many more such visits. Thanks. Thank you. It's a great place to visit. <laughs>